Is value investing dead? Or when looking at today's landscape of high-tech companies, is it only that the old-school measurements and methods formalized and popularized by Benjamin Graham and others, including the innovations adopted by his mentee Warren Buffett and Buffett's business partner Charlie Munger, are simply incapable of detecting what real value looks like anymore? Today we introduce and critique an alternative outlined by Adam Cecil in his new book, Where the Money Is, Value Investing in the Digital Age. Stay tuned for what might make you a more confident investor right now on the Retirement Lifestyle Show. Welcome to the Retirement Lifestyle Show. I'm your co-host, Roshan Langani, and today we've got Eric is uh, back with us, but Adrian is out today. So it's a, it's two of us again today. Eric, welcome back. How was the conference? Oh, the conference was fantastic for, um, you know this, but uh, just for those that don't, I was at a podcast conference once again and learned a lot. So I'm going to even be trying in the course of our conversation today to put some of the things to use, one of which was speak directly to a single listener. So, uh, listener, I hope you're feeling like we're speaking directly to you, not to uh, not to multiple listeners, but just to you. Yeah, and actually, Eric asked before we started, "Who are you talking to today? Can you picture one person?" I said, "Yes, uh, I can picture you, Eric, because I think you'd find this topic really <laughs> interesting, uh, as as I do. I'm I'm definitely looking forward to it. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about what we've been reading and uh, applying it to the to to the markets potentially." I believe, and Eric, tell me if you agree or disagree, but I believe this is a great opportunity for the investor. The markets have been down. Uh, this, the last time we had a, a hit like this in, in my mind is, is uh, like 08, 09 timeframe. Fortunately, it's not as bad, but mm -hmm. when we dropped for COVID, it was the fastest decline in recovery in history. So you didn't necessarily have uh, as much time to react. Whereas mm -hmm. right now, I think you do. And I've been studying the market stocks and reading uh, constantly to find things that are out there. And I and today we're going to break down some of what uh, what Eric and I have been reading, and you can apply it then to the market and hopefully find some good profitable opportunities. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's really true, Roshan, because I, one of the things that I, I don't know how deep we're going to get into each of the things that we've been reading lately, but I, just in terms of setting the context, I think you've our our listener has heard us say before that we have uniformly, as we survey the forecasts to uh, forward returns to asset classes. From when I say that large, large U.S. or small U.S. or international or whatever, all of those asset class forecasts are much more subdued going forward for the next decade or so than is typically the case. If those subdued forecasts are true, then when you do have a swift downturn like we've had to start the year, that does present the opportunity to ask yourself, is there indeed perhaps the special opportunity that's an exception to that overarching um, theme of perhaps lower returns going forward? So you want to you want to take advantage of these declines when they arrive and look for hunting opportunity. Yeah, I, I agree. And we've talked about the the lower returns before. I wouldn't necessarily say I, I, I wouldn't either agree or disagree just because I mm -hmm. think the market has various cycles and you'll find opportunities and you can find opportunities in all of them. So hopefully those maybe those broad market projections for lower returns, maybe maybe they're accurate, but uh, hopefully uh, you can still find opportunities to do well. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's jump in the first one. The first the first book um, that I, I just finished this and it had me revisit another one that that we may talk about today, depending on time. But where the money is, uh, where the money is, value investing in the digital age by Andrew, uh, by excuse me, by Adam uh, Cecil, and he, what he talks about here is is an interesting concept. So, I'll give you some history and background on it. Uh, Benjamin Graham's considered uh, the you know the godfather or the founder of value investing. He was Warren Buffett's professor. Warren Buffett took what he was taught by Graham. And he started the Buffett Partnership, where and what Graham was teaching was was buying companies that were 
way, way undervalued where in theory you could liquidate the company and profit. They would call them cigarette butt stocks. And the reason they would say that is, I'm sorry, cigar butt stocks, because it's like finding a cigar butt on the street that you can still get a couple puffs out of it. That, that was the, where the term came from. So uh, what, what Buffett did then is he then uh, took it to a different level after working with Munger, where instead of buying these cigar butt stocks that they were saying was a typically a bad company at a good price, they said, why not buy a good company at a fair price? And that's when it shifted a little bit where, uh, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, the name of the company was a cigar butt stock. It was a dying uh, suit lining company that he bought. And uh, you'll see in various publications at times, Warren Buffett would say that wasn't a great investment because China came in and took over and he knew that was going to happen. But he was able to harvest money out of that company to invest elsewhere. And then later on in his career, he'd buy companies like uh, like Coke that he's owned, you know, forever. And he just saw the it was a good company at a fair price. He saw them expanding. He saw the value of their brand. And what um, uh, Adam Sissel is now coming up with is what he's calling the next level of value investing, which is a way to value some of these high flying growth companies uh, that are out there within the value framework so you don't miss the opportunity. So just to put it into context, Amazon would never be considered a value stock. Uh, or I, should, I shouldn't say never would be. It never has been in its history. Who knows what's going to happen in the future? But a value investing, typically looking for stocks that are selling cheap, you know, below typical metrics are price to earnings, how many multiples of earnings you're paying. And you're looking for a low number there Amazon's always been high. And he talks about other companies as well, like uh, like Google, which actually does it, isn't too far from the value framework today. But he talked about investing them as, as they're at this highest growth stage. So, Eric, we're going to dive deep into that. I know you're very familiar with uh, value investing, the concept and what it is. What do you think of uh, the author's concept at this point? Does it sound possible to me or do, does it sound... Um, almost counterintuitive, like like these couldn't be value uh, stocks. Well, actually, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very important insight. So if we think back to, we can maybe call these value 1.0, value 2.0, and value 3.0. Exactly what for, he does for, in the book, actually. Okay, all right. Uh, to use this, as you said first, it's just flat out cheap with the assumption that companies, irrespective of their quality, are going to cycle through phases well that where they'll be underpriced and overpriced since the market tends to get things wrong in both directions. And so the the Graham formula was buy things when the market's got it wrong to the downside and wait for them to come back, then move on to something else. And then as you pointed out, value 2.0 is is Buffett and Munger, Charlie Munger saying let's add in a quality element, growth at a reasonable price. And now in this case, is, and you're more familiar with this than I, but in terms of looking at what um, this author has done is he has said, you really need to dig in and do a lot more diligence on the, uh, uh, in terms of an accounting uh, process to look carefully at what some of these companies are doing since they tend not in many cases to spend a lot of money on assets. Instead, taking using the exam, Amazon example, which I think you cited a little bit earlier, in that case, that company um, and Jeff Bezos from the beginning was taking the profits as they came off of that business and immediately recycling them back into research and development and, and essentially doing everything possible to expand the business. It wasn't returning stuff in, or returning profits to shareholders in the form of dividends, or, or at least at that stage in the form of buybacks, it was just constantly plowing that back into more R&D and, and the business. So Adam Cecil, um, as he points out, then it, by walking through this careful accounting process, what you find is these are amazing cash generating machines, even if that cash isn't immediately being transferred into the hands of investors. And as a result, the nature of these businesses is missed by, or the power of these businesses uh, to generate future growth is missed by the value investing measures that historically have, have been used. 
And I use a lot of those. You use a lot of those. Um, I, for example, we've talked m multiple times about free cash flow and its importance, particularly in in measured in, against something we call enterprise value, which is essentially the equity of a company plus its debt. There's a little bit more to it, but that's about it. Or the sales to that enterprise value, or uh, you know what the, the other measures as well, earnings to the enterprise value. So. Um, I, I think it's a fascinating concept. I just don't, I, I haven't really taught myself how to do that accounting process in the quite the disciplined way that um, apparently he has done that. And now that having read the book, Roshan, as you came to grips with what that process would involve, do you feel like, okay, I can see how that could be straightforwardly implemented by an, or an average investor, or does it seem like it really would take a specialized set of skills to do that, that, that kind of work? I mean, if you if you uh, do the uh, homework, I, I do think the average investor can do it. It is definitely time intensive, though, right? Mm -hmm. So what he does is uh, he when he so what what one thing that's very interesting is when you typically look at value investing, you, they're typically looking at price first, right? They're they're looking at and you you had mentioned some of the ratios to enterprise value and and, and so on. He actually flips that over and he tries to analyze the business quality first. Hmm. And when, when we talk about business, business quality, he's got a, uh, a checklist. He calls it the uh, BMP checklist for really simple reasons. The B is the business quality. The M is management quality. And P is price. He calls price the veto question. So if something's good on the first two but not on price, you don't, you don't buy. You wait until there's an opportunity. But with the, the business quality, uh, he, he's looking at, he wants something that has a low market share, it's in a large and growing market, and has a sustainable competitive advantage. So you had asked about the average investor. The first two, I think, are pretty straightforward and e easy to figure out. Low market share, you can look at the company's annual report. Sometimes they'll talk about their market share. Sometimes you can look at their annual report and just see what they've done the year before, and then you'd have to do a quick Google search to figure out what the total market was. So it's not that part's not too difficult. The other part um, is is it in a larger growing market? Well, the market share will tell you that, and you can get various data points to look at. I was recently looking at a home builder because uh, uh, I was just looking at that opportunity. The markets are down. We've got the issues with home. Uh, with homes right now, you, the Fed raising rates, slowing down home sales. So those stocks have come down and there are opportunities there. But we have a shortage going back to 08 and 09, right, of, uh, of uh, homes mm -hmm. available. So I can see that as a growing market. Now, the last one on his business quality is the sustainable competitive advantage. And that, to me, is the part that would be more difficult to figure out, right? If you go ahead. Oh, well, you know, you finish your thought and then I'll have a question for you. Well, so the, the, I just want to say uh, what is a, a sustainable competitive advantage. So the first part is the competitive advantage. What does this business have that puts it or gives it an edge or a competitive advantage to its competitors? Now, whether it's sustainable is can someone else just come in and do what they're doing and, uh, and take over their business? And there's not, there's a uh, judgment that will be involved in making that decision. You can't quantify that. One interesting point he brings up in the book is, uh, is uh, people have asked Warren Buffett in the past what he considers himself as far as his job or his role title. So not title of CEO, but what he considers himself. Do you know what his answer is? Uh, I think that heard? he's a capital allocator. Is that how he, he considers it? He says it? he's a business analyst. A business analyst. I think mm. is such a, it's a very basic thing business analyst versus financial analyst, not basic thing. It sounds like a minor difference, business analyst versus financial analyst. But I think it makes a world of difference in the investing process. A business analyst is looking for a good business. A financial analyst is looking at the financial data and looking for the numbers to make sense. So mm -hmm. what, the, the important distinction to me, to me there is, um, uh, and going back to, to Cecil's point, is that sometimes the data the numbers aren't going to dictate it and you're going to have to do more homework. So like in the Amazon example, and Eric, you hit the nail right on the head saying, well, they spent so much money reinvesting for the future growth. Well, what Cecil suggests you do is to compare it to other businesses, you've got to take out the, um, 
you've got to imagine, well, let's say they were just harvesting the business they have. So what part of that uh, capital expenditure do you need to maintain the business versus what part do you need for future prospects? And then he adjusts that number uh, in his analysis of a uh, of what he uses earnings yield, which is the inverse of price to earnings. And he mm-hmm. uses that because that, that's something that uh, another f- uh, popular investor, Joel Greenblatt, um, uh, or famous value investor, popularized about 10 or 15 years ago, where that allows you to compare stocks uh, to bonds as well, because you're comparing a yield scenario mm-hmm. there. So um, that's a, a long answer to what you had, <laughs> what you had just asked. But Well, let me untie a few things that you said there, and I'm going to mm-hmm. have a f- questions on some of them. So... <clears throat> You talked about some of the ways in which so, some of the measures that he uses, which are a sustainable business advantage or sustain, sustainable business model. Is, sustainable is that competitive advantage. And that, by so, the way, okay. is not anything, any new concept. Uh, Buffett's been talking about this since, I believe, the mid 80s in terms mm-hmm. of but that's value 2.0. Right. What, mm-hmm. what you talked about looking for a good business at a good price. So when I, first of all, let me just say the business, the process of business analysis is I recognize not going to necessarily conform to our preference for hard quantitative numbers all the time. In some cases, it will involve subjective assessments, but it is the case for at least for me uh, as someone who thinks about factor-based investing a lot, it is for me always the question, well, how would you uniformly and without bias introduce a measure that you say is salient? For example, sustainable competitive advantage. I know, for example, that uh, Morningstar uses this with their moat concept. You know, how wide is the moat? That and well, also attempt- is a Buffett terminology there. The moat, I believe that was started by him. I b- yeah, I think that is indeed the case. And so in terms of expressing or quantifying these so that you don't subject yourself to the risk of a nice story, how do you how do you quantify it? I, I think in some cases, people see what they want to see or they're they're led to accept a premise on the basis of a good story. But it doesn't necessarily mean that 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 attribute actually does exist for that company. So how does he solve that problem? How would he quantify or measure what a sustainable competitive advantage is for a company? So the competitive advantage part, uh, there are um, areas you can measure for that. So typically mm-hmm. what you'll look at is either return on, uh, on capital, uh, which is the net income divided by the total capital. And if you've got a The higher the number you have, uh, better. So just to explain it differently, if the company has a dollar they can reinvest in the business, well, what do they think they can earn? And you can find companies that have had a 10-year track record of it being, you know, double digits or more. And Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Munger, Charlie Munger has been on record saying, well, a company's performance will closely follow what their return on capital is. That's the competitive advantage part. Sustainable, that's the hard part, right? Mm -hmm. How... That's where you've got to look at it and you've got to make some, some uh, judgment calls on can they keep this competitive advantage. He actually, uh, in his story, in his, in his um, book, uses a vonage, a voiceover IP phone company, mm-hmm. as an example of a company that doesn't ha- didn't have a sustainable competitive advantage. When they went public, their sh- stock shot up and he had said he had a client that was saying they want to invest in it. And then a few years later, the stock was below the, the IPO price because there is no competitive advantage there really. Any other company can set up a phone using the internet as opposed to using phone lines, mm-hmm. right? So, so, so that could be there. He does touch on a few, uh, a few concepts on this with the uh, competitive advantage. And I'll tell you, I've been doing a lot of homework on this concept as well, because this to me, there, because there is no specific number or data point you can look at, it makes it the most complex, right? I mm-hmm. can adjust, uh, I can go out and look at Amazon's earnings and say, okay, comparing them to other retailers or web services businesses, what do you need to put in to, um, 
uh, for maintenance capex, right? Maintaining maintenance uh, capital and adjust those numbers and get that earnings yield. That's not that difficult to do. It'll take some time. I'll need to look at competitors and research, but I can do that. The sustainable mm -hmm. competitive advantage piece, there is no specific data point or, or source. You look at these return on capital and return on equity metrics to start, and then you say, okay, well, what is their advantage? So he breaks it breaks down a few, and I, and I, I think I think he breaks down three. There might be a fourth that I just uh, I didn't remember. But one is, are you are they the low cost provider, right? If they're okay. the low cost provider, that is a sustainable competitive advantage because if people can't produce cheaper than them, you're not going to have many competitors. Uh, the next one he talks about is brand, which connects well with what we talked about earlier with Warren Buffett and Coca Cola, mm -hmm. and he actually I believe. I believe it's this book. It might be another one where he quotes Buffett in the 80s where he's giving a speech and he says, uh, Coca-Cola can go around the world and people will associate that with the drink and putting a smile on your face. Back then their ad campaign was have a Coke and a smile, right? Mm -hmm. And he had said, there's no way RC Cola can go around the world and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm paraphrasing that, but that, that's the brand impact. Another one that they, that they talk about in there. Um, I wish I could remember the name of the company right now, but it's a soap brand that they consider the the company that's that really first executed on uh, branding uh, a product. And, um, uh, and I'm going to look it up right now, just see if I can remember the the names. What's funny is it's it's still one of the top brands they said he says in the book in India, and I can remember visiting family and seeing that bar of soap and just never hmm. having heard of it. Uh, hmm. before anywhere, anywhere else. Hopefully it comes back to me and I'll share the, the name uh, with you. So what you're describing though are some of the categories that I know in the moat conversation have come up. Another is a network effect. And so that if you have, you've essentially the next created one, exactly. mm -hmm, a, a large enough array of, <clears throat> or span of, of control. Others cannot necessarily easily replicate that network. And as a result, you, you're, competitive advantage not only is uh, current but it's probably sustainable so but I, I i and i can talk more about this question but i wanted to come back to another part of your overall introduction which was the bmp business management and price as mm -hmm. his sort of three step process for assessing whether something is is attractively valued yeah, so business I, I, Business, we just touched on one last thing on competitive advantage, because I think you touched on probably the most important one, especially in context of the book. That network effect is where uh, the opportunity lies in, in tech. Remember, his, his book mm -hmm. is, it's called Where the Money Is, because he thinks all the money is going into this, this tech space, and that's the opportunity. And it's how do you find a way to value it? Mm -hmm. And that competitive advantage is, is first analyze the business as competitive advantage. Well, that network effect is a huge one. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, the, the iPhone, for example, right? You've got they have created a network there through their messaging and their and their FaceTime. And actually, this is the next competitive advantage is where they able to create a platform. So, more importantly, the iPhone in this example, they have a platform where you can download apps on them. Doesn't cost Apple anything for the apps. If you buy anything in there, they get thirty percent. Right, mm -hmm. so it's it's a it's it's a revenue, but not a cost stream because they built the platform. The network effect he talks about, uh, like a uh, uh, Facebook, everyone's on it, so that's what that's what you've got to use to connect to everybody. There are and there have been other social media um, uh, platforms uh, out there, uh, but they just didn't have the network that Facebook has had which keeps them, keeps them going. Now that company is going through a lot right now. So there mm -hmm. may be changes or opportunities, but that's another thing about just how quickly things change in the, in the tech space. But now we, let's move on to the next one, which is management quality. Mm -hmm. He's got uh, two questions on there that he, he asks. One is, uh, does management think and act like owners? Um, the second one is, do executives understand what drives business value? So on both of those measures, see there, that brings me back to that part where it's, it's so slippery. It seems to me it's, it's, how do you, how do you measure 
those two things, whether business business managers act like owners and understand what drives the business. I mean, is do you see what I'm saying? How do you how do you measure that except well, by attributing? Well, they must because the business is doing well. No, okay, so, <laughs> so I'll, t- I'll tell you this. So mm-hmm. the, the data points I mentioned earlier for sustainable competitive advantage, return on capital and return on equity, those mm-hmm. are also many times under the management effectiveness tab by some some investment firm, right? Some places where you're looking at data. So that'll mm-hmm. give you an, an, an idea. But I think in order to really get the answer, you've got to read annual reports and, and uh, listen to or read the transcripts of their um, quarterly earnings calls. Uh, and so what you'll see is just what they're talking about. Like I'd mentioned I was looking into this home builder. Well, mm-hmm. their very first beginning of what they talked about, and they, they use a return on equity over return on capital, but they say that's their, that's their focus and that's their concept. So that's one part of it because they could be saying that, but not actually doing it. Mm-hmm. And that's where you've got to look at, well, what are they actually doing with the, with, uh, the money? Mm-hmm. So they get that money coming in. What are they doing with it? An- another, another metric or area you can look at is uh, when they, if there's an acquisition that they're doing, are they buying it at a good price? Uh, will it help build the business? Or are they just acquiring to acquire and then going further? How are they paying for it? Are they paying cash for it? Or are they issuing shares? They're issuing shares. They're diluting your ownership. And I'm talking about shares. Another thing you can look at about acting like owners is our share buybacks. It's become popular over the last, what, 20 years or so to do share buybacks. But are they doing it at the right time? Now, are they buying it when their stock is cheap? Or are they doing it just to do it? Just because just because they think it makes them look good. Mm-hmm. So. Um, uh, uh, another area with this, and I think we'll save the second book for later just because, uh, of time, but mm-hmm. another area about thinking and acting like owners, well, are they owners? Do they own shares in the company? Mm-hmm. Right. And if they do, are they, are they, is it significant or an insignificant amount? Are they buying shares or are they being granted shares? So when with think and act like owners, it can definitely be the actions they take, um, uh, but it can also be, well, are they actually owners? Are they doing things the right way? Uh, the next question under this are, do executives understand what drives business value? Uh, that, that to me, you've got to follow where the money's going, where they're putting money and where they're, where, what they're ex- investing in or within the firm. So going back to that return on capital concept, that's, a, that's a, uh, an indicator of what they've done in the past. Right, it, whether it's for management effectiveness or competitive advantage, that's what they've done already. Well, are they going to be able to maintain it? You've got to look at what they're planning to do going forward. So this is another one where, yes, there are some data points to give you clues, but uh, you had asked me, can an can an individual investor, an average investor, uh, do this? My answer to you at the beginning was yes, but it'll take time. I think you're seeing why these mm-hmm. two major concepts of management quality and competitive advantage, there are no data points or numbers. And then I'd mentioned how uh, he looks at price last versus the business and very often value investing will look at price first. Well, he goes at it about, uh, goes about it on this way because if you're only looking for good businesses and you're patient, hopefully the good price will follow. So sometimes if you start with price, you may be looking at a bad business that's at a good price, right? So I think you've got, you can start on either either end. He suggests going about it this way. The point is just a response to your question of, well, how do you quantify management? You can't just on numbers alone. You've got to do a little so, bit of both. Yeah. So I guess that when I hear all of this, first of all, I, I do think it's an interesting approach. I really, really do. And I do think it has merit. I'll also say, though, that it seems to me as I'm sort of thinking through all of the elements that you're explaining here, Roshan, that it sounds a lot to me like perhaps a case of mislabeling rather than calling this value Mm 3.0 or trying to fit all of these other forms of attribute analysis. That's what I'm going to call their attributes of these companies, good management teams, uh, sustainable competitive advantage, et cetera. 
and trying to fit those into the language of value, maybe there's an existing category that already subsumes those ideas. And I think that the one that comes closest to it for me is the broad factor that's used in the factor research literature called quality. In, a, in essence, quality is looked at, looks at closely return on invested capital and return on equity, return on assets. Quality looks at profitability ratios. Quality looks at growth in those sorts of things that you may be familiar with a couple of the ratios that we've maybe just touched upon once or twice in our previous conversations. Uh, for example, the Petrosky F score or yeah. the Sloan ratio. And what these are academics that once upon a time said, wait a second, there's a way to, to, to separate the, the tadpoles from the frogs here or the fish from the minnows. And to do so by applying some of these accounting ratios or accounting relationships as part of the screen to ascertain which companies maybe um, thrive in these sorts of environments. So, um, in, in fact, I was just reading some things yesterday about Petrosky F scores and about Sloan ratios, or not you know, so much about Sloan yesterday, but about Petrosky, and just struck again by how many of the concepts that you're talking about today that come from this fit very neatly into the sorts of ratios and changes uh, over time, year to one year to the next that Petrosky was examining. So the. Uh... I I don't disagree with that. I would just say though, uh, some of the there isn't going to be a a quantifiable data point for some of these things. I just don't think you're going to be able to find a number on. You can try. You can. Uh, you can. I think what it sounds like is you're looking for things that are already in his existence that that could potentially help you in this decision, mm -hmm. and I believe that that. Part of it is going to have to be doing the research and analysis and coming to a conclusion on your own. There mm -hmm. isn't going to be a number or a data point that will that will necessarily line up and say yes, this works or no, it no, it does. I I can I can accept that. I would say though it might help you get a lot closer if you you apply some of those ratios first or some of those those measures first to narrow the pool of the companies that you're looking at. So, yeah, I, and I would say you'd probably need to have multiple different types of screens to narrow the pool and then look into those companies. Because mm -hmm. right? what you don't want to do is, uh, just going back to the Amazon uh, example, there's no arguing it's been a phenomenal investment, right? If you put right. your money in Amazon, you'd make a kill. Mm -hmm. It will not show up in any of these measures. I wonder about the profitability measures, though. Uh, I, I mean, I, I can, uh, give me a moment. I can tell you that, tell you that it might, it might show up on the profitability, but it won't show up from a price perspective. And I, right. I am wondering from like, uh, the Petrosky measure, what it would look like and the, the concept of what they're doing there at Amazon makes sense. Cause if they're reinvesting, which they really should be in looking into other businesses, they will, um, they will they will lower the tax bill now with for potential greater earning in the future. Right. And he actually compares Amazon and Google in his example and, and uh, in this book. And he says the reason Amazon's done better is because of better management. Google, a lot of their founders and managers aren't necessarily interested in profitability. And uh, Bezos having a background prior to starting Amazon with Wall Street understood all the financial concepts and was trying to do both. Hmm. So, Eric, the numbers from Amazon, their return on equity is at 9%. Their return on invested capital, it looks like it's at 5.84 right now. So like, that's not going to show up on those screens. And once again, I'm not saying uh, go invest in Amazon or not. What I'm saying is sometimes if you're looking for, for these um uh, these numbers or data points to help you find your investment or as a screening tool, it may cause you to miss some opportunities. You had mentioned the Trotsky F score. Theirs is, is average. It's a five out of nine. Hmm. So uh, once again, as I said, I'm not saying go invest in Amazon or not. What I'm saying is if you look for purely these 
data point metrics that that aren't going to line up exactly to good management or uh, whether there is a competitive advantage, you're going to be eliminating some potential investment opportunities. Fair enough. All right. Well, was there more in this framework that you wanted to make sure our listener understands? Just the last point that he touches on or the last part on his his, uh, BMP uh, checklist is price, which he calls the veto question. And it it says he's looking for an earnings yield of 5%. That's an inverse of the price to earnings. Now, using Amazon as an example, just because we've been um, we've been talking about uh, them just now, their PE ratio has almost always been high. Right now, it's 114.76. So its earnings yield is 0.087%. He wants you to look at 5%. I'm bringing this up because this is not just purely the inverse of price to earnings. It's the inverse of the adjusted price to earnings, the adjustments being what he uses once he's analyzed the business. And the the biggest point that comes to mind there is the uh, maintenance capital versus uh, CapEx. And you want them to spending on R&D, but how much they need to. So what he's trying to do is take a growing company and come up with a concept to compare them to an existing business. So he's making adjustments to compare them to those existing, existing businesses. So when I read this, I really like the book. I really like the concept. Um, The one question or criticism that I that I have, though, is um, is is it? And there's a uh, term for this in uh, in sort of behavioral finance. But are you looking for an answer to your question? And is that the path you're on? So you're eventually going to find it. Mm -hmm. Or was he looking for a framework? for investing and this is what he came upon right mm-hmm. and I, I don't know that it, it actually i there's part of the answers in the book he had years of he's he was a value investor he had years of underperformance and he saw an opportunity he saw the future really being in tech and was trying to figure out a way to invest in the space so part of it is he was searching for an answer um uh but i wonder if there were any biases in there well or uh, so I will, uh, let me, in terms of having thought about this with you this morning, it seems to me that it, certainly he's done an interesting work and it has a, apparently been for him transformative in his investment approach insofar as he did then have the intellectual conviction that he needed to proceed with investing in companies that otherwise he would have avoided like you know with insofar as they just didn't fit his framework of thinking so i admire him for having the flexibility of mind to go ahead and to do that it does strike me though as i already in, intimated here that perhaps what he's attempted to do is to force his his framework into the language of value when there's no requirement that it be forced into that he can simp- I, I think it's possible to simply say that whether or not we describe this as value, there's, this is a framework for thinking about it, how companies should be measured and whether or not they present in, interesting and compelling investment opportunities going forward, leaving aside the language of value. Just are they, are they a, a, an attractive investment for the long run? Why I would say it fits in value is because of his last point being price and that being the veto power. I a see. lot of okay. times when you get into growth, uh, mm-hmm. you will buy growth or maybe growth at a reasonable price or GARP investing might be a better way to look at this mm-hmm. than purely value. But many say, well, that's just another type of value, right? So mm-hmm. that, that's arguing semantics, but that's what, what to me makes it different from growth. If it's just growth driven, um, you don't, you're less concerned about the price and, and the price would not be the... Uh, the would not have the veto power, I would argue, if it was growth. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that's that's fair enough. So, well, listen, Roshan, we've covered a lot of territory and we're 40 some minutes into this podcast. Is there anything else that you think is important to raise as a as a, an important point or is there a sort of summation comment that you have about this book? Well, I, I would, uh, what I like about it and what got me interested in it is because I very much do believe that technology has adjusted things like I, 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 you know, the, the 
sort of famous last words in investing is this time it's different, right? Mm -hmm. And then eventually things go back the same. Well, what, what makes um, technology a little bit different is you don't, it's not as capital intensive, right? Mm -hmm. So you're able to build these, like, uh, uh, you know, we, Amazon is, is a little different, but Google's a trillion dollar company, right? They don't have property plant equipment, really. You know, they, they didn't, they don't have these big factories, which a lot of value, at least when you go to value 1.0, is based on, well, what are the tangible assets that they have? What if they were to liquidate? So I do think that there needs to be something. Uh, I think there are opportunities there, and I think there are opportunities to buy them at. But considering myself more of a value investor, I think you always have to focus on price. So what I do like about this book is it tries to figure out a way a way to to do that uh you know get get an idea to look at look at the price of these companies that you're buying uh as opposed to them being just growth so i i do like the concept and where he's headed i and i do very much think especially in tech that's where things are things are going because uh, yeah i find it um i feel like because we keep picking on amazon i'm gonna go back to it mm -hmm. um there are so many good things going on in Amazon that I feel like you've got to go beyond just the the just the final numbers. Now he's attempted to figure out where you go beyond the numbers of just the ratios and the financials, uh, and I, I I I don't I think this is a very good starting point at least at least for me. Right? It's mm -hmm. it's. An, and what I mean by that is there are things I would add or possibly adjust to it. And I would suggest that for any investor, you've got to make it your own. But mm -hmm. I do think he's done a, a good job of, uh, of at least taking this on. I don't know of any other investor that considers himself a value investor that's done this. Even you know, Buffett's got a huge position in, uh, in Apple uh, right now. I actually think that's his biggest holding. But however, when he did it, it was very much like uh, like his value 2.0 type investment, right? Mm -hmm. He bought it after the network was built, after the platform was was there, and the company's really more reaping what they've sowed. Not that they're not going to grow in the future, but that's the point where he bought it. So I don't necessarily know know that that was very different. So that's that's what I find very interesting from the value investor's perspective. Is, is this a way to look at or invest in tech? And another thing that this has done for me, at least, is it's got me digging deeper in some of the companies where um, I don't know that I would have because of those numbers, right? So uh, everyone's time is limited. So we use screens or, uh, Eric, as you were trying to look at these quality measures and so on, we're using these because there's time is limited. There's so many companies that you can look at out there. Um, and it's, it, it's you're, you want to say no to something quickly so that you can move on to something else so you can potentially find a yes. You want to put the odds in your favor of finding something you want to invest in. And what this has done for me that's a little different is it's going beyond the ratios, digging deeper into the company before I would just say no or or before I'd say, hey, I'm looking for a better price. Interesting. Well, Roshan, it's, uh, it's a fascinating topic. I appreciate your introducing it. It seems to me that the point you've just made is it's, it does involve, it's a very labor intensive process, but maybe yes. it's something that once you kind of get your, your confidence built on the review of, you know, the, your first 20 or 50 or a hundred companies, you, you feel like it's a lot more straightforward, recognizing the patterns between, you know, the, the 101st or 102nd company than it was with numbers one, two, and three. Yeah, and the more you do it, the quicker you can eliminate and move on as well, right? Mm -hmm. You can, uh, you know, I've definitely had stuff where I just read a couple sentences on their annual report and said, okay, this is not where I'd want to be, even mm -hmm. though some of, the, some of the numbers look like they would they would work or or it seemed like a good concept. So mm -hmm. yeah, don't don't um, be afraid to to say no, and it's okay to miss an opportunity at the in, of the investment if it if, if it was due to protecting your capital and avoiding the risk so mm -hmm. there are plenty of opportunities out there great well listeners 
listener. <laughs> We're going to have in our show notes the link to this book so that you can track it down and read it for yourself if that's of interest to you. I'll also put in the show notes a link to a book review of the book written by Daniel Rasmussen that appeared in the Wall Street Journal. And so you can you can look at both of those and see if you want to move forward with that analysis. But Roshan, thanks for coming prepared with a really interesting uh, reading. I'm sorry that we didn't get to the other book that you had read and wanted to prepare. And so we'll have more in the in the uh, show um, episode list that we can come back to in the future and dive into some of these other concepts as well. Definitely. If you haven't done so, bit, uh, listener, we encourage you to go to our website and uh, that's retirementlifestyleshow.com, retirementlifestyleshow.com. You can go there and subscribe to the show. You also can go and uh, find uh, us on your favorite player. And um, once you've done that, you can subscribe there as well. We have both the YouTube version. And for those that are more, much more audio only, we've got the podcast version alone. So as when you've discovered us one way or the other, but we encourage you to subscribe. If you have any questions for us, we what we do in our day jobs when we're not uh, being sort of uh, pod, famous podcast hosts is what we do is uh, we serve as financial advisors, retirement plan planning specialists in particular. And so you can find a way to contact us there and see if a conversation um, you can set up a conversation with us in any way you'd like. So thanks so much for listening. We look forward to um, speaking with you again next week.